Hey everybody, this is Cherie Alexander, and my guest today is Mr. Mark Sanborn. Hi Mark, how are ya? Hi, I'm good, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you so much for having a chat with me today. Um, so, for those of you who might not be familiar with Mark, as but you should be, uh, he is an amazing professional speaker and an expert in the area of leadership. And he has a best-selling book called The Fred Factor, and it has just been uh, upgraded, I guess you could say, with the brand new book, Fred 2.0, and I will provide links to the book for everybody in the comments and section uh, below, as well as some clickable links here in just a little bit. So thank you again, Mark, for joining us. And so happy to talk to you about leadership and influence and communication. So I'm just curious, what got you interested in the area of leadership in the first place? Well, I got interested in public speaking when I was very young because I did so badly at it in a contest. And I decided that I really wanted to learn how to be a good public speaker. It was a challenge. And just as some kids get into football or some kids get into the science fair, for me, it was a competitive speaking. Mm -hmm. And what I quickly realized is that one of the key abilities, certainly not the only one, but a key ability of any leader is the ability to, to communicate well and to speak well. And so that really introduced me to leadership opportunities because I had become a, a very effective communicator at a young age. And so that got me down the, started down the road of leadership in some youth organizations and then college and then business. And so these many years later, uh, I'm grateful I didn't do very good at my first public speech or I might be doing something very different today. But uh, leadership, of course, is all about influence, not just through the spoken word, but through the written word and, the, and a number of other skill sets. And so I spent a lot of time working with uh, leaders uh, at every level, talking about both leadership and how to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary, which is really what my book, The Fred Factor, and now Fred 2.0 is about. Yeah, so if you don't mind, can you give us sort of a two, three sentence synopsis of Fred Factor first, just to cue everybody into your awesomeness? <laughs> sure, well, The Fred Factor is the ability to continually create new value for the people you live and work with through passion, creativity, and commitment. Uh, the book is seen as a customer service book. It sold about 2 million copies worldwide. I'm very gratified by that. But I never wrote it as a customer service book. I wrote it as a business philosophy book mm -hmm. because the centerpiece story is a real-life postal carrier who I just found out last week is officially retiring on July 3rd. His name is Fred Shea. Fred is retiring. And Fred is retiring. And uh, Fred did such an extraordinary job of delivering my mail that I wrote a book about him. I used him as an example of how literally anybody, regardless of your position or lack thereof, regardless of how much money you make or what you do, how anybody can turn the ordinary into the extraordinary. And Fred, uh, I think, has been so well received because, you know, he's not the typical Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uber rich success story. You know, we look at people like that and say, well, they have all the money in the world. They can do anything they want. Fred is like all of us. He's an ordinary guy with an ordinary job who takes advantage of the opportunity every day to make it extraordinary. In Fred Point 2, I, I didn't just update the book. As a matter of fact, it's a totally new book. I wanted to stick to the theme of how you could go deeper and wider with these principles. And, and also, I updated people about Fred. I interviewed him and his wife, and I really provided some more behind-the-scenes information because over the years, people always ask two questions. Number one, whatever happened to Fred? Mm -hmm. And number two, what more can we do? Because you know people had used the ideas, and they were looking for kind of the advanced or graduate-level class. Mm -hmm. And in the new book, I talk about uh, among other things, what to do if you're head Fred. And I know that's kind of silly language, but it's meant to be in fun. And that is, how do you lead Freds? You know, the, I always tell people that the, the key to having more Freds in your organization, more employees that turn the ordinary into the extraordinary, is to first and foremost model that in your work as a leader because people won't do what we tell them to do. They'll, they'll do what we tell them to do that they see us doing. Mm -hmm. The second thing I tell people that I think is, is so simple, it's almost nonsensical, but it's so forgotten, is we got to recognize the good work that people do. You know, Fred, for many years, had never been recognized by his employer. And most employers today, it's easy, you know, to get into the trap of paying attention to the people who are underperforming or who aren't doing good work. And we kind of ignore the good performers. And over time, 
that kind of extinguishes their desire. Not that they're doing it for the recognition, but certainly uh, people can feel taken advantage of if nobody ever pays attention and notices uh, the good work that they do. So let's talk about that because I know that that's one topic that a lot of my clients bring up is recognition. Recognition is an important part of developing rapport, developing relationship and, and communication in general. So what are some of your best recognition tips? Because one thing I've found is people don't want to have that checklist of, okay, did I recognize X number of people for X number of days in X number of situations? Uh, that's some feedback that I've heard from clients before. So what's some of your favorite recognition tips if it doesn't come naturally to somebody? Well, I have a new member of my team named Paul Moya who just graduated from Harvard. He shared a story that I found fascinating about Tom Mendoza, who's the CEO of NetApp. And Tom realized that you know one of the most important things he could do as a leader was to recognize the good work that people do uh, at NetApp. And uh, that's a, a multi-billion dollar company that's kind of, many people aren't familiar with them, but they provide a lot of the, uh, the, the technology that goes into many of the things that we, we use in this digital world. So Tom implemented a program where he invites people to recognize their colleagues, their peers, for something that they do by emailing him. And then within an hour, he recognizes that person personally, whether it's an email or a quick phone call. And so he's kind of enlisted others to be his eyes and ears, you know, and I'm oversimplifying a bit the story, but he, he's asked others, help me catch people doing something right. I mean, that that's the essence of what he does. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it's really powerful when that recognition comes close to the time that person did something and not three days or a week later. So I would say, you know, number one, uh, even though people may push back against systematizing recognition, I don't think there's anything wrong. We systematize important things. You know, we don't have pilots taken off without checklists. We don't have surgeons that don't uh, have a pre-op checklist. So I think if somebody says, well... I really don't want to you know, systematize it. They're missing a point. If it's important, you can create a system for it. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it, may see, it doesn't take away from the sincerity of the recognition. What it does is it ensures that we, we recognize people more consistently and more often. Yeah, I think that's people's biggest roadblock is they think, oh, if I create this, this program that I'm following, then it takes away the, the uh, sincerity of Spons what we're trying to do. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it, it's not about spontaneity. It's about sincerity. You know, where, where I have problem is when people go through the motions and they have a form email or they have some kind of hokey recognition that the employee sees right through and they everybody compares, you know, how many, you know, recognition buttons did you get from our manager, Bob, last week? Right. That I do push back against. It has to be sincere. You know, people people are too smart. They'll, they'll see right through some kind of crazy... Uh, you know, insincere uh, appreciation. The other thing is that I think we have to be careful that we're really recognizing people for accomplishment and not for politics. You know, uh, it really dis it disincentivizes and when somebody who's a real suck up gets a lot of attention and recognition and people realize that person isn't good at their job. They're good at sucking up. Hmm. That's brilliant. Absolutely. More accomplishments than politics. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about, um, oh, I had a question for you, right? When you were talking about the form letters. Um, oh, I'll come back to that. So when somebody is wanting to improve their leadership communications, just I, I want to be a better leader for my people, what would be your top two tips for somebody? The first tip would be be very clear on what you're trying to communicate. I think probably the primary reason communication fails is people kind of muck about and hope that they'll they'll figure it out as they're talking. And of course, that puts the burden on the other person to wait till that person's figured it out to really try, try to understand what they're saying. You know, when when I was in sales before I picked up the phone, I always had what was called a call objective. You know, I didn't just pick up the phone like we hear so often. I'm just checking in. Well, checking in isn't really an objective. You know, did I want to find out? what the customer needed. I want to find out why the customer hadn't purchased from me for a while. You know, what was the reason for the call? And then you just reverse engineer. You know, I say that effective communication, despite the technology that we now have to achieve it, always boils down to these things. It's about being heard, understood, and then getting the person to take appropriate action. 
I'm really not an effective communicator when I tell my 15 year old son to put away the dishes and an hour later they're not put away and he says I know dad you know he, he heard me and he understood me but he didn't take action and that's the difference between telling and selling that's the difference between communication and influence mm-hmm. I think that that's a big mistake that leaders make is they think, well, you know, if I just tell people what to do and why to do it, and, and most leaders don't even go to the why, they just talk about the what, they'll do it. And in a perfect world, they would, but they all often will do it on their own time or they may not do it with any kind of true, you know, enthusiasm or, or commitment. Mm-hmm. So as an influencer, we need to go to that third level, not just being heard and understood, but designing our communication in such a way that we give people compelling reasons to act. So you know, if I say to my son, you need to put away the dishes, and if you don't do it in the next 15 minutes, you lose your phone, that's far more effective. Now, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm advocating negative punishment or negative consequences in the workplace, but I, that, that would be a good example of how I'm more likely to get the action uh, that I, uh, I hope for when there's some kind of a consequence or benefit tied to it. Right. One of the biggest influential techniques that, um, as you know, I'm interviewing spies and con men and all those kind of interesting individuals and they always seem very skilled at and their first objective is to find what motivates this individual and there's some baseline things that motivate most people and they figure out which one of those triggers uh, works for that person so and in fact I just talked to Jim Cathcart the other day and we talked about motives and motivation what are some of your tactics that you might recommend or use to help somebody figure out for this person, this motivates that person. For, for this individual, this is what motivates them. Uh, because everybody's a little bit different. How do you play Sherlock Holmes to finding those motivations? Well, let's take it back to, to Jim, who we're both uh, good friends with. You know, Jim says to know more, notice more. And I think that's the first key to motivation. You know, if you say to Jim Cathcart, uh, you know, uh, I would like you to, uh, you know, have lunch with me in a week to discuss the speaking profession, he may just because he's a good guy agree, but if you say to him, you know what, I'm a motorcyclist too, I know you love to ride, let's ride to a little cafe I found an hour north of uh, of San Diego, uh, then Jim's really motivated because Jim really likes motorcycles and he really likes to ride and he really likes to help people. So if you really know what people value and, and you just why, that's what they do, you know, not what they say but what they do, that'll give you some insights. Uh, I had a, a, an administrative assistant many years ago who was independently wealthy. Uh, I suspect she had far more money than I did at the time, and yet she obviously wanted to be paid for the work she did, and, and I paid her fairly. But I, I really didn't have that old fallback motivation of money as an incentive or a motivator. At the time, she had two uh, high school age students, uh, children, and they loved to camp. And so if I really wanted to to spiff her, give her a perk, I would say, hey, why don't you leave her early on Friday afternoon and, and, and come in late Monday morning, mid-morning, because I knew that would give them an extra day to camp. And they get up to the mountains for a decent hour, and they could come back on Monday morning. And, and so that was a simple way of observing what mattered to her and then trying to use that as a way to uh, reward her for good work and or uh, incentivize her for, for other work. Right, right. One of the things that I do, and again, I learned this from uh, my CIA contact, is to actually have a file of those important individuals and and list out this is what they like, this is what they're interested in. And a lot of you know contact software has those little notes section that nobody pays attention to, that nobody adds those extra notes. But if you haven't seen somebody in two years then you might need that file to remember, oh yeah, this is, this is what they're about, this is what they enjoy. Do you have any sort of system like that? Well, I, I've recommended for years Harvey McKay's book, Swim of the Sharks, and it's an old book now, and I don't even know, it's probably still in print, but you could probably get it for a dollar at a used bookstore. And he's got two ch- chapters in that book, especially if you're in selling, that you really need to, to look at. And it's on the McKay 66. I'm not sure why I split it into two chapters, but the McKay 66 or 66 questions that all the salespeople at the McKay Envelope Company answer about every client. Some of the questions are obvious, you know, what kind of business they're in, uh, you know, what their position is, etc. But the more interesting questions are, you know, what kind of car do they drive, what sports teams do they follow, what college did they graduate from, what are their kids' names. 
and, and I've always explained it, and, and Harvey and I are friends, and I've, I probably should ask him if I'm explaining it the way that he used it, but I think I am, that when you make envelopes, which you basically use pulp and ink uh, and adhesive to make, I mean, they're not a sexy, high-tech product. The way you differentiate that envelope is you know more about the person who sells or who uses that envelope, more about the person you sell that envelope to than your competition. And, and that gives you ways to add value and provide additional service and, and to motivate them. So I've always said if you really want to, and I'm not sure you need 66 questions, Harvey's list is really thorough, but use that as kind of a jumping off point to find out what kind of information do I need to track about the people who are important to me in business and in life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, so Mark, tell us a bit about what's next for you now that Fred 2.0 is out. What's what's on the horizon? Well, you know, Solomon said of the making of many books, there's no end. And that was before the printing crash. You know, they already had a deluge of books, even when they had to handwrite them. <laughs> um, writing books is not easy. I would never say that writing books is easy, but selling books is hard. It's a very competitive marketplace. And, uh, you know, the whole world of digitization from ebooks to how we access information is changing. So I'm always looking for uh, you know for ways to provide good ideas to people. Like in a project with uh, Larry Winget, Lisa Ford, and Randy Pennington and Scott McCain, we just created an online program called A Year of Business Success, where you'll get a three-minute video each week from one of the five of us, along with some actionable steps you can take to build your business. Uh, that's one example of a, a new direction that uh, I've gone and partnered with some of my, my good friends in the business. The next book I'm working on is about why brands die and how not to be one of the brands that dies. And uh, we're shopping it around right now. I'm kind of like Thomas Edison. I don't want to. I don't want to invent anything nobody wants to buy. And so I don't want to write a book nobody wants to publish. But uh, I've got a co-author, Jerry O'Brien, and he's a a, a great guy for brand management skills, Coors Light, and worked at Quiznos, and Red Robin, and P&G, and so he and I have got this entire book conceptualized and partly written. We're just waiting for a publisher to say, yeah, that's uh, that's the next big thing. We'd love to give you a lot of money to publish it. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I love the, the action steps that you share with us today, and if you don't mind sending me a link to the year of business success, is that what it was called? I uh, I'll yes. be happy to add that into the video links as well. And right. as well as add a link to your website so people can sign up for your easing and get your tips and see everything that you're doing. Because tweets, and it, all things. of it. Okay, right. Where does it ever stop? <laughs> I don't know, but I look forward to the day when there's like, this is the definitive list of how you can keep in touch with me. It's got one button on your computer screen and it says send and it goes everywhere to people who want it not to people who don't want it that's, right that's the secret right and then not the robots that are are out there for <laughs> sure <laughs> well great yeah and um and so everybody can keep in touch with you however they like through the many methodologies and i look forward to staying in touch with you mark this was fun thank you for having me it's always great to uh, talk with you thanks you too bye-bye